Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. I'll be speaking a little bit later, but right now I would like to introduce Miss Winnie Foster. Thank you. If I had a bell, I'd ring it right now because we are calling attention and notice and saying St. Petersburg, awake, wake up. So St. Pete is opening its doors to a new way of communicating. And as we listen to one another and find our commonalities and our differences, we learn and change. And that is what our mayor and vice mayor and many people in this room are helping to do. So thank you for being here. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, an eight-year-old girl named Winnie went into a small town library and borrowed a book. It was a book of Chinese short stories. And I was, my life was changed by that, by the stories within that book. These people were across oceans, but they were very like my family. And so I felt that I could find family wherever I went in the world. In later years, I um, heard my grandfather tell stories of how Quakers came to the United States because they were persecuted in other countries and came for religious freedom. And I understood that story. It was many generations old. My children are part of that heritage, 13 generations in this country. So we believe that story, and we believe what has flowed from it. But since then, I have read history, literature, and find and have learned that there are many contradictory stories. And unfortunately, we learned just recently of the contradictory stories that led people to a tragedy in Charleston, South Carolina. There are many tragedies and many hopeful signs for our future. But when my husband told me that we were moving to St. Petersburg, Florida in 1970, I cried. I said, I don't want to go. I know it's going to be racist. And I found that there were many evidences in city government, in neighborhoods, in other ways. Even our beloved St. Pete Times had a colored news page at that time. But we've moved along, we've made a lot of changes, and that's good. But we're embarked now on a new adventure. And th that new adventure, if we stand together, is going to bring us on the threshold, not into a new age, but on the threshold of a new age. And it will bring us, hopefully, a better, happier, safer city. So again, welcome. 
to St. Petersburg's story. I lived in West St. Pete in the Bear Creek neighborhood. I had a great childhood growing up. My mom was one of 15, so I have maybe 200 or more relatives in South St. Petersburg, and a lot of us were the same age. So I was born into a sorority of these cousins who were friends, who were like sisters, and we had a great time growing up. Every day was a slumber party. It was awesome. I had an idyllic childhood. Yes, it really was. I was just blessed with that. I think part of it is because from a very small child, I had been into possibilities versus expectations. It's just my chemistry, the way I'm wired. So it was idyllic because it was all wide open. And I have this support system that's unbelievable. They were always like, you can do anything. Go try it. If you think it is, there is some reason you thought it. Go get it. So I don't think it, that it's formulaic or anything that is generalizable enough that I could repeat it other than to endorse freedom. To me, it's the journey as opposed to the destination. So it was like it couldn't go wrong. It couldn't go wrong. I was in St. Pete growing up with the hundreds of cousins. It was like perfect. And I know everybody doesn't have this, but the things that made it so rich and so wonderful have very too little to do with anything material, very little to do with anything, any kind of typical metric for success. And really, it was about the freedom to just be blissful. That's what made it idyllic to me. Hmm. I met my husband at the Times. I was a reporter and he was a reporter. And it's very interesting because I recognized him instantly. I recognized his soul. People look at me quizzically, but it's my truth. I swear it. So he was walking by and I was working and I looked up and I, I saw him and I recognized him. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I called my friend Joy and I said, Joy, I just saw my husband. And she said, who is he? And I said, I have no idea. She said, you have to go find out. Joy and I, we have this friendship where that was a conversation that actually made sense. I had to know who he was. And people have a SIG, you know, their photo. So I looked through it until I found his picture. And there was a messaging system at work, just like Instant Messenger now, but this was before that. So I sent a message to his name that said, you are my husband. And he sent back, who is this? And I said, you have to come see. And he came over and he looked at me and he walked away. And we didn't talk for quite some time. We just got to know each other over the years. And I was right. I think it was divine. It was instinctual and certain. It was like one of the most certain things I've ever felt in my entire life. I recognized his soul. That is my husband. From that second that I saw him, I knew he was my husband. I didn't know how, I didn't know when, and I thought that I'd never be married. The idea of a husband was very foreign to thought to me, but it was almost like it was implanted with certainty. Three years later, we got married. <laughs> My husband is white and 15 years older than me. So that orientation period of my husband to my family was very interesting because it was so foreign, especially for my parents 
who know and love people of different races and certainly don't carry any unpersonal bias in their choices, but certainly had an expectation that my husband would be more like me. So they had to get used to the idea. They had to really figure out that, what that meant, and they were concerned. They wanted to protect me from unnecessary hardship that they thought I would probably experience through that choice. So it took them a minute to get comfortable with the thought that this choice was not going to somehow compromise my life in some way. Listen, my cousins were all very curious. They just wanted to know, what? <laughs> what? How? Really? I really haven't experienced much difficulty as part of an interracial couple because in the newsroom there were interracial couples everywhere. And I grew up in a very integrated kind of circle. So I didn't really run into any kind of issues from my perspective, but my husband has had to choose some friends differently and make some choices and defend his principles where they weren't tested prior to because it didn't just emerge as an issue, but all of a sudden he has a black wife and it does, it comes up. His family's great. He's from a big liberal family from the New England, New York area. Hmm. My reality and existence is very different from that of my parents growing up here. My children's reality is worlds different from mine. The social strata, expectations, externalities, realities that each generation experiences all dictate difference and that the way we approach each other. My children are mentally global citizens. They do not subscribe to boundaries. They certainly don't subscribe to boundaries such as their neighborhood. They feel that the entire world is theirs to access. That wasn't my thinking when I was 11, but I felt right at home at Tyrone Square Mall, and that wasn't my mom's thinking. So I think it's time to seamlessly integrate and become one city where strengths are celebrated across the board. I think this is our next step. We're so close to realizing our potential as it relates to our collective empowerment. I just think we need to make some steps in the direction to socially integrate. I think it's so important, and I would never have known, except for my experience that put me square in the center of both parallel tracks because of who my husband is and because of where I grew up. In some ways, it's starting to happen. I think in order for it to be sustainable, it has to happen organically. It can't be forced. It can't be legislated. There's no mandatory aspect to it that will be authentic. But I think barriers are truly breaking down because of opportunities and because of exposure. Our tolerance and readiness are what's evolving and what's new. Thank you. We were legally married at the courthouse on January 6th, 2015, right after we got our marriage license. Gay marriage had only been legal in the state of Florida for a few hours. It was something we'd been waiting a long time for, to be happy and legally married. It was a big step for us. We'd been together for a long time, but now it's legal, instead of just between us. Our relationship is strong, and now it is recognized. Having the paper to show it, the backing of the state federally, it does feel different. We feel a little more accepted. I was so excited that day, I couldn't even think straight. We had a hand fasting afterward on the 28th of February so that our families and everybody could all be there. It was outside on the beach and it rained all day long until right before the ceremony started outside. And then it kind of started drizzling just toward the end. And still, everybody said how beautiful it was. And that's what we wanted. There are about 50 people there, mostly family. My cousin, 
made a beautiful rainbow cake, three-tiered. It was pretty. And the ceremony was very nice. And I was running late, of course. <laughs> we were both so nervous. And I was surprised that we were both nervous after being together for 21 years and then going to get married. I think it's because of how real it was. It was a lot realer than it was before because we actually, we got married in 2001 in Washington, D.C., but it wasn't legal then. So this time it is for real. It is forever. She is stuck with me forever. <laughs> I think we should be able to work anything out. Talk anything out by compromising. I mean, both of us pretty much compromised, so any one thing is really not too important. That took me a little bit to learn. I'm a slow learner. But after 21 years, I basically grew up with Dolores. I was 21 when we got together, so I pretty much grew up with her. And now our lives are intertwined. And it was time. And Dolores changed her last name to mine, so now we are a couple of Purdue's. Like the university, not like the chicken. <laughs> and that helps. It helps a lot with the vehicles, and the house is now in both of our names. And we have the same rights as other people now as far as hospitals. When it comes to decisions that your spouse can make, now we can do that too. And before we were legally married, I had to go to the hospital. And Dolores asked to come back with me, and I had asked for her from the emergency room, but for some reason, she had to stay outside. But everybody else had their spouses with them. And finally, she got upset. She said something to the attendant, and she was eventually let in. And now we don't have to worry about that. Now when we go to the doctor and the dentist, we say, this is my wife. And I'm surprised at how accepting people seem to be. We get things like, congratulations, it's about time. Even at the bank, when we went to change Dolores' name. And it's really nice because people seem to be happy for us. And we tell them we've been together for 21 years. It's kind of nice. I feel like we fit in. And that is a very big thing. And I love St. Pete, especially our new mayor. He's the bomb. <laughs> he marched in our parade. He recognizes us. He raised the flag. St. Pete is home, and I feel welcomed here. But just the other day, we were in a restaurant, and there were three older gentlemen sitting behind us. They were kind of loud, and I don't know if they realized that we were together, but they were going on and on about gay marriage and saying how disgusted they were and that they were tired of hearing about it. And I guess things like that will always happen. We work at a company where it's OK to be gay. We have a gay pride committee. And there were domestic partner benefits for us even before we were legally married. But there are people who have worked there for 30 years. And they still don't come out and say that they're gay. And it's kind of sad. I think they're just afraid of how people will act toward them. But I think. I think it's going to be more accepting the more the younger generation comes of age. I really hope so. That'd be nice. I actually didn't get into trouble very often growing up. I, the thing I got in trouble for the most was taking things apart and trying to rebuild them. I, I used to take everything apart and borrowing my dad's tools without asking and losing his tools. I probably got in trouble more for that than anything else. Uh, but during all my years of school, I was only written up once. Uh, it was actually kind of funny because it was for uh, putting hands over mouth and making animal-like noises. <laughs> yes, sound effects and noises and doing imitations has always been a a hobby. I even used to be a ventriloquist. So this kind of stuff has always been interesting to me. Uh, that's probably why I got my undergrad degree in broadcasting. I grew up just off 
Eight Mile Road in Detroit. We were predominantly Jewish in that area of Detroit, but our next door neighbors, two doors down in the cul-de-sac, were Catholic, and we were very close with them. Our whole family would decorate the tree with them for Christmas, and they used to come over for our house, uh, to our house for the Jewish holidays. Looking back, it was really my first interfaith experience, way back when I was five, six, seven years old. That one family, they were our closest friends. The son was my sister's age and the daughter was my age. She was my best friend. My parents moved us to St. Petersburg when I was about nine. So I finished Pasadena Elementary and then Azalea Middle School and Boca Ciega High School. Go Pirates! <laughs> My sister actually went into high school before me, and Bogey had riots back then, as did a number of the local high schools. Fortunately, by the time I started, race relations seemed to be getting better. For me, my fondest memories in high school were with the basketball team. Uh, Ken Robinson was the coach. May he rest in peace, a wonderful man. And I tried out, and I tried out, I think it was my sophomore year, but I was horrible. I mean, really bad. And coach told me if I ever tried out again, he would personally shoot me. <laughs> but he knew how much I loved basketball, and, and he found a way for me to be involved with the basketball team. I, I became the team trainer. So if someone got hurt during a game, I was the one who came out onto the court. I had a blast, I loved it. <laughs> there were only a couple of us who were white. The rest of the team was African American. I think my senior year I was the only white guy. And I love those guys. And I still run into them on the street occasionally here in St. Pete and we relive our memories. Great guys. My experience during my lifetime has always been that people are uncomfortable with something that they are not familiar with. And until they become familiar with it, they're afraid. And whether it's being the only white guy on a team full of black guys on the basketball team and, and singing the, on the bus, Rapper's Delight, or Flashlight by <laughs> Parliament, or whatever it was, and hanging with these guys and learning we are all the same. I felt the same way about the time my sister took me to a gay bar to hear the Indigo Girls in Georgia before they were big. <laughs> First time I'd ever been in a gay bar. And seeing women sitting there holding hands or men holding hands. And at first, it was like unusual or uncomfortable until you realize we're all the same. Love is love. So it's just being exposed to that, getting past those perceptions, realities that weren't true realities. My parents were a lot like were like a lot of the parents of their generation. They were tough. They had not been exposed to a whole lot. So my exposures kind of opened their eyes a little bit. And when I would say, hey, I want to have some of the guys from the basketball team over, this was not something that Jewish parents were used to. <laughs> they were a little uncomfortable, and we had to have some discussions, because that's how their generation was. I look today and I think, how fortunate are my kids? Because we have an African American president, because men who love each other and women who love each other can now get married and legally adopt children. They're growing up at a time when these prejudices that have been in place for so long are going away and their generation isn't interested in it. They don't want that stuff. They don't understand it. My parents wanted me to marry a nice Jewish girl, but 
I knew on our first formal date that I was going to marry my wife, Carrie, who is Catholic. She is the best thing that ever happened to me. She's fantastic. 23 years this year. It's a lot. She puts up with a lot. She puts up with me. She's amazing. Even before we got engaged, we had studied each other's religions. Ultimately, we decided we were going to raise our kids Jewish. Both of our families are based on strong family, food, guilt. I love it. <laughs> and I enjoy going to church with her. We never talked about converting. Because you can't convert for someone else. It, it has to be for you. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. We're both based on a belief in God and follow the commandments, the Ten Commandments. When you talk with someone from a different culture or religion or somebody that may be an immigrant who has moved here and you learn about their culture, that's what life's about. It's creating that fabric, that richness. One of the things that I did when I was campaigning for my job as mayor was to walk a lot of South St. Pete, and we asked people, uh, tell us what the biggest challenges are here in St. Pete, because I, I wanted to hear from them what their experience was, not my perception, but their real life experience. If you haven't lived in someone else's shoes, you don't know what it feels like. It's easy for me to say as a white Jewish guy who grew up in an affluent neighborhood, I don't know what they're talking about, there's no problem here but walk a mile in their shoes. Here is the goal that I have set for myself. If I haven't changed the perceptions and broken that barrier that separates the city at Central Avenue, if we haven't created the city of opportunity where the sun is shining on everyone, then I haven't done my job. What I'm hoping is that when I leave office, whoever my successor is, that she or he has a city where all areas are thriving, where there are arts and culture in all areas of the city. So that if you're living in South St. Pete, you've got restaurant choices, you've got shopping choices, you've got job opportunities. If you live on the north side of town, not northeast, but <laughs> further north, you've got those same opportunities and great parks. We finally built a park up there. And for my kids, Jordan and Samuel, I hope they can say that their dad was an honest man, that he cared about people and tried to do the right thing and was true to himself, stood for what he believed in. And hopefully, they will do the same. And if they do that, I will be very proud of them. I married in 53. I was in college. My wife was one year behind me, so when she graduated high school, we got married. Virginia Mosley. We grew up together in Monticello, Florida. Her parents had four boys, and she was the only girl. Her dad had a saying he used around town to frighten off the boys. He used to say, <clears throat> there's nothing in this drugstore will kill you no quicker than I do if you be on that girl or about that girl. <laughs> so what I did was go around the other door, go talk to mom. When I was in high school, when I brought Virginia a gift, I brought one for her mom, too. Her mom thought I was wonderful. We went to elementary school together, but you know what? When I went to middle school and I started kind of looking at her, she did not like me at all. We both walked to school, and I would wait for her on this one corner. At first, when I would walk with her, she wouldn't say anything to me. It was like I wasn't even there. 
I would ask the question and she wouldn't say anything. And I can remember one day she stopped and she looked at me and she thought, oh, I made a catch. And she said to me, why don't you leave me alone? <laughs> <sighs> I was so discouraged. But then another girl came to me, one of her friends, and she said that Virginia had something, had said something about me, and that gave me courage to keep on. So I kept on, and we were finally married. We were married for 55 years. She passed on in 09. May the 2nd was six years. We had seven biological kids and one we raised. So we had eight kids in the house besides all their friends. <laughs> I look back today and I really don't know how in the world, because now I can get my two grandchildren and in three hours I've used up all the energy in that one day. <laughs> and I don't know how my wife and I did all that, but she did it. We went to Sunday school, we went to church, we had dinner, and then friends, and then everybody. And we had the same number of hours in the day, and I don't really know how it happened. For many years, I had a job at Pinellas Lumber Company. I worked as a delivery guy for three weeks. Then they put me in the warehouse. The guy who was my manager, well, he was really a wino. So I began early on to do his job. Then something happened to him. He had a surgery and unfortunately he died. Now everything was on me. I was making $1.35 an hour. Rather than becoming the manager, they had to get a white guy. And I trained three white guys, different ones that came in, couldn't handle it, but here's the problem. When the big people downtown wanted information, they'd call the warehouse. I was the one they asked for. The last manager they brought in says to me, <clears throat> look Preston, you ought to have this job. I don't know nothing about it, but they offered it to me and I'm taking it, not because I know what it is, I know I got to lean on you, and that's the way it is. And that's the way it was. So I went downtown. And I didn't ask to be the manager. I asked for a raise to $1.50 an hour. And I was told flat out, you is the highest scale of blacks in this company. We cannot raise you anymore. If we raise you, we have to raise all of them. Mm. Because I was black, they couldn't raise me, really. Right now, I'm still being punished because when I went to get my social security, it was predicated on what I had made. First, all those whites that I trained made twice my salary. Uh -huh. They had twice as much money to live on. Now, when we get to social security, their social security is going to come out twice as much as mine. So right now, they're getting twice as much as I am, so they live better. They can have something to leave as a legacy to their kids and grandkids. Now, most people don't even think about this, but it's a reality in life. So I'm still being punished for them. People, they don't have any idea how others have to live or how they live. We need to do our research. We need to also try to get over our fears because fear is the thing that keeps us where we are. I've had, I've had the longest tenure of any pastor on the South Side, 57 years. I was president of the Interdominational Ministerial Alliance for a few years, 
and we got the city to establish a department to handle rental and housing issues. Before that, we did not have a place to go for people to go with their grievances. I am absolutely going to work until I, well, until my days are done. I'm going to work for the community as long as I can because I want to make a difference. I want my grandchildren to be greater than me. I want the preachers under me for the congregation to be able to say they are greater, they are greater than Preston Leonard. That's what I want. <laughs> So first of all, we should introduce ourselves. Who are you? Hi, I'm Dr. Lillian Dunlap. I am the uh, artistic co-artistic director and founder of Your Real Stories. And you are? <laughs> I'm Jay Sheldon. I am the co-artistic director and also founder of Your Real Stories. And Your Real Stories has been producing theatrical journalism, that's what we call it, theatrical journalism, here in St. Petersburg and beyond for the past four years. And I, along with my esteemed colleague, Dr. Dunlap, have had the privilege of interviewing almost 30 community members in the past four years. Uh, we sit with them for hours at a time and script portions of their stories to be read by professional actors and heard by audiences from all over. And we chose this model because we believe in the power of storytelling to create incremental, powerful, and lasting changes in communities. And we're so honored that the city of St. Petersburg has chosen us as part of the team, which also includes competency performance solutions, communication research enterprises, and us, Your Real Stories, to work with them on their diversity and inclusion initiative, of which this evening's event is a part. Um, we will hold three more conversations over the next several months. Please see your calendars. And each one will share new stories. So every time you'll see new stories from residents all over the city. And uh, to kick this initiative off, we were so pleased that Mayor Kreisman and Deputy Mayor Tomlin volunteered to be the first among the group of storytellers. And uh, before I bring the storytellers themselves up on stage, I just, I'm just going to take this opportunity to commend everyone who has uh, submitted themselves to this process, um, thank them for their bravery uh, to share their stories, and uh, later you will have an opportunity, after uh, you hear from our storytellers, you're going to have an opportunity to share your story with a small group. And um, we do this because theater is designed to make you think. And uh, if you thought, if you felt touched, if you were moved, entertained, or felt connected to something that you heard or saw, please uh, use that as impetus to fully engage in the group discussion. And uh, in the words of Bishop Leonard, don't be afraid because fear is what keeps us where we are. And in the words of Mayor Kreisman, um, please listen carefully because you can learn how to walk in someone else's shoes. You know, uh, we have been in interviewing people for a number of years and we interviewed all of you, it, you on a very special day, uh, the day that you were, were getting your license. Uh, and Bishop Leonard, we interviewed you quite some time ago too. But let me ask you first, Bishop, uh, you have heard your story uh, delivered. How was it, what was it like uh, hearing it now in this, in this group? Well, it was exciting. Uh, and uh, I, as I look around uh, to see that there are a whole lot of other people uh, is listening to my story and I'm sure that there are people there that really have similar stories I'm not the only one and uh, I appreciate being asked to come to share thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you Lynn. 
Good idea. Anne? Yeah. So I'm going to pose the same question to you. What was that like? I know we've in, I've interviewed you twice, one moments after you were married and uh, once yesterday. So what was that like hearing your story? I thought it was very touching. It yes, about it made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was very touching. And we both are honored also to be able to tell our story to y'all. Well, um, I'll speak for myself. I was honored to hear it, so thank you. Thank you. You know, this has happened to me. I, at one point in one of our shows, had my story told, and you know, actually when it comes to things about performance, I'm pretty arrogant about it. But I was taken aback a little bit, just sort of hearing my words and my, my uh, things uh, come out of someone else's mouth. So I'm going to give you a chance to say more about it if you want to. It, it is very uh, kind of, um, I, I, don't, I can't articulate the, the way that I... We caught you I speechless. Yes. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Mayor, is, did we catch you speechless as well? Or what was it like hearing your, hearing your story told? It, it's it's uh, in some ways very uncomfortable. I know this is probably going to sound very strange from somebody who's in a, a public position and has um, been in public service for a long time, but it's one thing to, to go out and talk on a subject, on a policy. It's, it's a whole nother thing to hear yeah. someone recounting your life and your words yeah. Yeah. Uh, and things that are very personal. And um, so it's, it's a little unsettling in a way yeah. uh, and a little uncomfortable. Uh, certainly very different. That's not anything I've ever had done before. What he said. He, 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 <laughs> 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 this is good. I see you both chose wisely. <laughs> Great. Well, um, while we have you here, uh, also, was there, did you hear anything in any of the other stories that you might want to uh, comment on before uh, before we go on? Did you hear anything new? Uh, well, um, you know, I think both stories were were uh, I think very powerful uh, and spoke to you know the challenges that that they've each the couple has faced and, and the pastor has faced. Um, but that we as a community face mm -hmm. uh, and you know what it's like when you get past it uh, and you know being able to, to finally be legally married and yeah. getting a sense of what it felt like for them you know to finally be validated and recognized for what they've felt for 21 years mm -hmm. um, you know and same thing for the pastor and his personal experiences and you know what he wasn't able to do then versus the impact that he can have now, mm -hmm. you know, and to me, that's really what this is. It's about, and it is, it's powerful to hear other people's stories and what they've experienced. It's one thing to, to see the news or to read it sure. in a book, but it becomes very real mm -hmm. uh, when you're hearing, hearing it spoken uh, and it's, it, it's somebody's life. Yes. yes. Stories are so powerful, yes. you know, and we each have a story. We, as a society, tend to focus on those that we find to be pro prolific or profound. But uh, I really believe, as evidenced by tonight, there is um, profundity in each of our stories. And uh, this way that you've honored them is really lovely. So thank you. I think so. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.